In April 1983, a couple who'd been accused of murder gave an interview to detectives and local news crews. They stated that they would confess to two other murders in California if they could have a press conference. They wanted the world to know their insane, ludicrous religion, their beliefs. A six-hour drive away in Los Angeles, Jen Carson's mother broke the news to her. She said, um, I told you that um, your daddy was really sick. He hurt people, and he's going to be going to jail to keep himself and other people safe. I immediately asked, are the hurt people dead? And she said, yes. And I said, do they have mommies? And she said, yes. And I said, are they sad? And she said, yes. Jen's father and stepmother were on a mission to rid the world of what they believed was a dangerous scourge. Michael and Susan Carson were referred to in the press as the San Francisco witch killers. You could become a witch just by looking cross-eyed at Susan, touching her, anything that violated her. In her mind, she would order you to be killed. And her loyal disciple, Michael, would kill you. This is around the time of the arrest. I just look so happy, and it's so sad to me to think a year and a half or two years after this photograph, I was um, a very suicidal child. And that just makes me so sad. On the 10th of March, 1983, what had started as a normal day for San Francisco detective Frank Falzon took an unusual turn. I would come in every morning early, probably around seven o'clock, and I would sit at my desk with a cup of coffee, reading the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper, uh, particularly two sections. I like reading the Sporting Green, and I loved reading Herb Cain. You read Herb Cain and you got the flavor of San Francisco for the day. He had all the up-to-date gossip. I started reading Herb Cain and I came upon a kind of strange paragraph in the column about a murder in San Francisco. The newspaper columnist had received a letter from an inmate called Michael Carson on behalf of himself and his wife, Susan. Both had been charged with the murder of a man called John Hellier. Michael had sent a letter to the San Francisco Chronicle saying he wanted to get more publicity about the crimes that they had committed. They were currently locked up in Sonoma County Jail and weren't getting proper publicity in that relatively small town. And they wanted to come to San Francisco and uh, be get publicity for their crimes there, including the uh, killing of Karen Barnes. I thought it was kind of strange to read that in the paper. So I went out to the front part of the office where books were kept on all the murders that occurred in San Francisco. And I started going through one book after another, looking for the name Karen Barnes. Karen Barnes case was a cold case. March 7th, 1981, police discover um, Karen's body um, in her apartment on her kitchen floor. And they begin to interview neighbors, friends, other individuals in the Haight-Ashbury community of San Francisco and all state that she had a very strange couple um, staying um, off and on in her apartment. James Michael Carson and Susan Carson were the suspects, but there were no linking evidence. They just knew that 
the Carsons had been living with Karen, so they were the prime suspects. At the time Frank Falzon was reading that bizarre letter in the morning paper, Jen Carson had been in hiding from her father and stepmother for almost four years. Looking back, I see that my father always had someone he was somewhat obsessed with. You know, when he was a child, he was an invalid and he was very attached to his mother. And then he seemed obsessed with my mother initially. And then he seemed very obsessed with me for several years, the first years of my life. He thought I was a psychic. He thought I was this, some type of religious creature that was being reincarnated and um, would ask for my advice to make decisions. Um, so, you know, I, he was both loving and bizarre at the same time. My parents met in university and they were very involved in the counterculture war protest movement of the 1960s. And they were kind of hippies. When they finished college, they moved to um, a community in uh, the South, to South Carolina, where white children and black children were placed in the same school for the first time, and many of the teachers quit. And so my parents moved down to that area to serve in one of those schools. Um, at that time, my um, mom was pregnant, and she uh, gave birth to me, their only child, and my um, father stayed home with me and decided to be a stay-at-home dad while my mother um, continued to teach. I think around this time about just under 40% of women were actually in the workplace, so this is quite unusual for them, but they appeared to be happy with this setup. This is actually a picture they took right after they got married. It's kind of their wedding photo. Um, they did go off and elope, so they took a picture together, and I think this is just a really beautiful picture. They're just so young and vital and happy. When I was about three years old, we moved to um, Arizona um, and the city of Phoenix and my father continued to be a stay-at-home father. He, you know, brushed my hair every morning and got me dressed and made me breakfast and took me to the park and took me to the petting zoo and read me books and was a really hands-on, you know, kind of hippie, stay-at-home uh, father. Individuals who knew my father as a teenager, and as a university student, you know, describe him as brilliant, very rebellious, um, definitely with perhaps, you know, his drug use, or he had an interest in kind of more extreme politics, such as more extreme communism. But as they began to be adults and, you know, have a child and go into their career, you know, he's continuing to talk about, you know, overthrowing the government um, and um, talking about violence. In the late 60s, early 70s, James and Lynn are involved in the anti-Vietnam war movement. They are very much part of that youth culture. This would have seemed very in sync with a lot of young people. But as Lynn and James become more settled in their family, life. She is now focused on the family and providing for the family, but James is still part of this movement in his head. James Carson's life increasingly began to revolve around drugs. He was also um, selling marijuana, which was illegal at the time. Um, so he would also uh, take me um, on drug deals, so I, you know, I remember him, um, bags and a gun with him and so on. And my mother at the time did not know he was engaged in that during the day when, when she was at work. My father really deteriorated um, at the end of their 10-year their relationship and he became very erratic. He went from being kind of an eccentric, 
you know, hippie in college to being a grown man who wouldn't work and who just wanted to kind of lay around and, you know, um, use marijuana. I think for Lynn, making excuses for James's bad behaviour may have been her coping mechanism at the time. She may have also viewed him as a decent dad because, let's face it, she was going out to work full-time, so maybe his relationship with his daughter, from her point of view, was working and was positive. And I think you tend to see this kind of behaviour in people when they're trying to cope with a lot that's going on. Well, at least he's doing that, and that's OK. Everything else, I will manage. In this photo, I'm holding my little suitcase, and this is the day we moved to Arizona. And it really, my mom does not look happy in this picture. I think this is the beginning of the end. He also begins to get very violent. He always has a gun on him. Um, every time he becomes angry with someone, he says he's going to kill them. My mother is blaming the acid, the LSD. LSD is a mood altering drug. Um, it does change perception. And I think she maybe thought, well, if he comes off that, he'll be okay. Then there are examples of him not being on any drugs and still being violent. And I think Lynn was just about hanging on. But I think the turning point for her came when there was a bit of broken glass that cut Jennifer's leg during one of Lynn and James's fights. And I think that for her was the that was it, that was the last straw. She was not going to tolerate her daughter being harmed. Lynn walked out, taking four-year-old Jen with her. Within days, James Carson would have a new lover and a new name. The moment that my father met Susan, you know, she said, your name is Michael. And he said, no, my name is James. Um, and she said, no, from now on, you'll be known as Michael. She then stated that she was psychic, she could see the past and the future, and that she saw that they were lovers in a past life. His uh, birth name was James Clifford Carson, and he is, from that night on, went by Michael Bear Carson. He was taken in by this woman, and he was under her spell, and he was at her command to kill whenever she ordered him. Nineteen seventy seven was a watershed year for James Carson. His wife and daughter had left him, and he met Susan, the woman who would become his new wife and his partner in crime. After his obsession with me, he seemed to move on to her and this then seems like the greatest obsession of his life. And I believe he very much wanted someone who would control him and that he could be subservient to this individual. And I think that this um, older woman played that role in his life. The background story on Susan was that she had a good marriage she had a son who was high school age. Um, her husband made good money, but it was not a life that she was happy with. One night, my father goes to um, a party with a friend. It was at the home of a wealthy divorcee who was living a very bohemian lifestyle. And so my father met this woman that was, you know, 10 years his senior. Um, and he instantly um, becomes very enamored with her. He had bipolar one, the more severe bipolar that would have delusions and mania. Susan was diagnosed uh, as having schizophrenia as a child. And I think they had a strong bond over their drug use and a strong bond with shared delusions. Um, and then I think both were also very hypersexual. So I think it was probably an intense sexual relationship as well. 
and then her desire to be dominant and his desire to be subservient. Soon after um, Michael and Susan meet, he never leaves. He comes to a party at her house and they're together from then on. They now seem to have become one person. They're operating as if it's us against the world. She's making strange concoctions of food with barley and uh, marijuana and LSD. Um, and she says we'll help them see more clearly the visions of the future. They claim to have this variation of a Muslim religion and that they knew when people were witches and they had some sort of distorted view of astrology, I was never able to uh, figure out where this witchcraft belief came from. After Michael Bear Carson set up home with Susan, Jen became a regular visitor. The first time I recall going to, um, for a custody weekend, at um, Susan's house, it was absolutely terrifying. So we got to the house and it was night and they opened the door and there was a very large entry room. It had a bunch of potted trees. In my mind, it looks similar to the forest from The Wizard of Oz. And so I'm entering this room with these potted trees and um, no furniture and poor lighting and it's dark and there was nowhere for me to sleep. Um, I recall sleeping on the floor and the only furniture in the home was a waterbed. On several of the visits, I was coming back from the visit and telling my mother they didn't feed me. And I uh, remember attempting to find food because they were passed out naked um, from drugs. And I remember attempting to escape from the home. I remember picking up a corded telephone and trying to dial anyone and um, and at one point I dialed zero and saying to the telephone operator, I want mommy. I look at them as two individuals that felt that they had this experiment with drugs, started hallucinating, started fantasizing about being very important people being God's disciples. There were times where I would say things like, I miss my mommy, and she would say, your mommy is a demon, she's going to hell. I have very vivid memories of, of crying and saying, I want my mommy, I want my mommy to rub my back. And Susan saying, um, you want me to rub your back? I'll rub your back. And she um, scratched open my back with her jagged fingernails. Jennifer is four or five years old. This is a horrifying space for any child, any person to be part of. When I was returned to my mother, I said my back hurts and that's when my mom found the wounds. I think anyone else would have called the police. But it was almost like she was so frightened and she felt that she just needed to get us away. And so at that point, she actually um, hid me at a church. She then is absolutely petrified very much believes these people are really, really dangerous and that, you know, this woman could kill me. Jen would not see her father again for almost 20 years. In 1979, Michael and Susan Carson went abroad on a religious pilgrimage. When they returned, Lynn and Jen had disappeared. 
Michael and my stepmother Susan began living this very nomadic lifestyle and um, in 1980 and they're um, growing large amounts of marijuana on a marijuana farm and then they are going um, to different locations to to sell the marijuana and they would go to Haight-Ashbury which was kind of the center of the counterculture um, 1960s movement. And there they encountered Karen Barnes, who was a young woman, age 23, who lived there, was a part-time housekeeper, was trying to get into acting. They met her at a party where everybody was experimenting with LSD, mescaline, and peyote. And everybody was high. Everybody thought that Susan and Michael were strange but not Karen Barnes. She was fascinated by them, and she invited them back to her home. The friendship came to an abrupt and brutal end one night in March 1981. Susan felt that she was a witch. And after doing all this drugs and tripping and LSD, uh, she felt that Karen Barnes had to be killed. So when Karen was asleep one night on the floor, they hit her over the head with a frying pan. And as she laid unconscious, they stabbed her over 12 times, killing her. March 7th, when Karen Barnes' uh, body is discovered, Michael and Susan have just vanished into thin air. They had hit the highways and they were hitchhiking with their backpack full of marijuana. And so they've just vanished into the wind at this point. A little over a year later, the couple struck again. In 1982, Michael and Susan had been involved in uh, an illegal marijuana farm which is in Humboldt County in the northern part of California. Susan is working cutting and um, cultivating the marijuana, and my father is working security. Clark Stevens was from Southern California, from a small kind of surfing beach community. And um, one of his uh, teenage best friends um, owned and operated this large pot farm. One day in late spring, Susan decided she had a bad feeling about co-worker Clark. Some sort of argument occurred, and she realized that Clark Stevens was in fact, he was a witch and he had to be killed. So she ordered Michael to kill him. Her disciple, Michael takes out the gun they had stolen, shoots and kills Clark Stevens. They took his body out into a marijuana field, covered it up and buried it. They attempted to burn it, but that was not entirely successful. Sometime later, there were some uh, campers in, um, in the woods, some hikers that were camping, who their dog appeared to be playing with an object. And um, tragically, the dog um, was playing with the, the head of, of Clark Stevens. So they called the authorities and they came and searched the place and they found the remains of Clark Stevens and then uh, that he had been murdered. So the people working at the farm uh, said that about the time that Mr. Stevens went missing, that the two people who had worked there, Michael and Susan, had disappeared. But the only last name that they gave was Blair. And so when the police searched for suspects under the name Susan and Michael Blair, they came up empty because that was a false name. Living on the run, 
Making camps in the woods, the Carsons were not heard from again for several months, until one unusually cold morning in January 1983. They had been hitchhiking from Bakersfield, California, and a man named John Hellyer picked them up somewhere en route to Santa Rosa, and they drove for about a day. They were in a truck where there was just the single bucket seat. And so two people ride comfortably in a pickup truck, but three, it's tight. And according to Michael and Susan, um, you know, uh, John's leg was touching Susan's leg. And, you know, that was taken as some type of sexual overture. And she said to Michael, I knew all along he was a witch. He's a witch. He has to be killed. You know, I believe they tried to kill him to steal the truck. Um, but, you know, they do claim that Susan said he's a witch, kill him. So in an area in the northwest part of Santa Rosa, known locally as Fulton, uh, the truck came to a stop on a river road, and witnesses observed a scuffle between Michael Carson and John Helliard, and eventually Michael Carson gained control of a pistol and shot John Hellyer twice in the head. Michael and Susan get back into the truck and they drive off. The police eventually spot their truck. There's a high speed chase and the Carsons are arrested and taken to Sonoma County Jail. It's where they remained until this article appeared in Herb Cain's column. It was at this time Michael and Susan, already on remand for John Hellier's murder, claimed to have killed Karen Barnes. Once I realized it was a homicide that was an open case in San Francisco, uh, my partner and I immediately went to Sonoma County to interview the Carsons. Susan says, no way. You want a statement from us? And you want us to admit to killings? We want the big city news to be here. We want to be filmed, and we want it in the newspaper. I said, I can arrange that. They wanted the world to know their insane ludicrous religion, their beliefs. They thought they could end up with a flock of uh, disciples and that she could be the right hand of God and she would have all these people following her, worshiping her. In January 1983, Lynn Carson heard that her former husband had been arrested for John Hellier's murder and was in prison in Santa Rosa, California. My mother felt some relief because she had then believed for five years that these people were dangerous and could kill her child or herself. So when they were arrested for killing other individuals, she felt incredibly sad for those families, but at the same time felt relief that her child was safe. She's experienced this man becoming more and more violent in their relationship. So for her, this may have not been a surprise that you know what, he went all the way because he was already in a very dangerous, violent space when I left him. Soon after my father's arrest, the letters began. He would um, send long seven, eight, nine-page letters to any addresses that he had 
for any relatives who might forward the letters on. The letters were very rambling. Do you remember your daddy? You were very small, beautiful. I had to go to Jerusalem. I came back, but I couldn't find you. I fought for God in a very bad place called San Francisco, where everyone hates God and does bad things. And it says, suicide remarks are torn from Fool's Gold's mouthpiece, the hollow horn, whose wasted words prove to warn that he is not busy being born, is busy dying. That is just chilling to me because I work in, as an expert on suicide. That's so bizarre to me that 25 years ago, he sent me this quote about suicide. Oh, that's chilling. Some of these letters I've never read in totality. Like I would read a few lines and then I would get upset and put them away. I think I'm seeing this for the first time right now and it just scares me to death. I need a minute. Um, In April 1983, Michael and Susan Carson used their press conference to reveal the full extent of their crimes. We brought Susan Carson and uh, Michael Carson into an interrogation room. We had the cameras going. Uh, we had the reporter there. We introduced the Bears to the press that they wanted, the media that they thought they deserved. And then I have to be perfectly honest with you, we sat there for four to six hours listening to the most disjointed, most nonsensical religious garbage I've ever heard. The fact that she was psychic, the fact that she was a messenger from God and that he was a disciple and he would act upon anything that she instructed him to do and he would agree. And I said, okay, please stay on the subject. Tell us about the killings. She would not. She had to tell us all about her religion. We listened, we listened, and then eventually she got to what we were there for. Michael and Susan were suspects in 12 other cases. In 1983, there was no death penalty in California for a brief time. So they chose to confess to the murders in California as a legal ploy to stay in California. Um, and so um, they then confessed to uh, the three known murders in California, which is uh, Karen Barnes, Clark Stevens, and John Hellier. It seems that Susan was wearing the pants, uh, so to speak, in this relationship, uh, and on occasion, she would order Michael to kill uh, the victim, and Michael felt that it, is, it was his responsibility to carry out the order. And it seems unlikely if, that, if they had never met that that particular situation would have occurred. So the adults in my life now know that uh, my father's been arrested for multiple counts of homicide. My mom um, was very concerned that it would appear in the media, and she didn't want me to find out through the media. I was just um, eight turning nine at the time, and she said, I told you that your daddy was really sick, and you know his new wife is a very bad person, and that we were going to stay away from him. Um, until he left her and got well. And she said, unfortunately, he got much, much worse. And um, he hurt people, and he's going to be going to jail to keep himself and other people safe. Um, I immediately asked, are the hurt people dead? And she said, yes. 
and um, I just put my head in my hands and just sobbed. This causes devastation for Jennifer as a child. She has to now go through a long process of disidentifying with the father that she remembers when she was little as the person that she loved, who looked after her and she had a good time with. And that's her narrative has been utterly obliterated. Several months later, I found newspaper articles that my mom had hidden in a drawer. And um, I remember trying to sound out and make out the word, uh, B word, that I didn't know what it meant. And I now know that word was bludgeoned. But I came in contact with all of the gory details, you know, smashing a woman's head, stabbing a woman in the face, setting a body on fire. I came in contact with all of these horrific details. And then my battle with nightmares um, that went on for a couple decades began. She also feels that she shares her DNA with her father. So does that mean she's a monster? And this is a very childlike perception of what's happening. In June 1985, Susan Carson stood trial in California for the murder of John Hellier. Her attorney was Harry Allen. It's a criminal defense practice, uh, an issue that people can be legally insane. But in the case of a plea of not guilty by re reason of insanity, the person themselves is required to say, my plea is not guilty by reason of insanity. The catch-22 in that situation is that a person like Michael Carson or a person like Susan Carson, they don't think they're insane. They think they're absolutely correct. Susan believed that she had a religious right to kill witches. There were a number of trials and a number of appeals, and they went on for nine years. Um, and so I was, during that time, also very fearful that he would somehow be released on a technicality. Eventually, all opportunities for appeal were exhausted. In all three trials, the defendants were convicted of first-degree murder and received consecutive life sentences to the California State Prison. So from the time I'm told of my father's arrest in um, 1983 um, until I graduate from university in, um, in 1996, I um, mostly do quite well in school, but I struggle with severe depression, um, severe suicidal thoughts off and on, and an uh, eating disorder, and then really horrific nightmares. As a nine-year-old child, I, my whole life changes. You know, now I'm the daughter of a serial killer. And um, I struggle to process that. And I truly struggle to match up the idea of that Michael Bear Carson that I read about in the newspaper was the same person that braided my hair every morning and fed me breakfast. I couldn't reconcile this. And so I then, in order to cope, started, you know, trying to think of him as kind of two separate individuals. I had to separate the two or I just couldn't move forward. Nineteen ninety seven was a turning point for Jen. At the time in the nineties, closure was a very pop psychology concept, you know, something to seek. And so my best friend and I drove about eight hours to Folsom Prison, where my um, father was incarcerated. 
and I thought it would be like um, a scene from the television show Law and Order, where there would be a glass and I would hold a telephone receiver and he would hold a telephone receiver. And so this sliding door opened and I'm in this open room. There's no glass, there's no receivers, and my father is hugging me. And so the last time I saw him, um, I was waist high to him. And now with heeled shoes, we're both six feet tall and he's hugging me. And I'm just shocked and I'm stunned and I'm, I, I just am just frozen like a statue. She's looking for the truth. She's looking for answers. She's looking for something that will enable her to close that chapter in her life. Some explanation, some remorse, something, some truth. He doesn't give this to her. I realized that he was lying, he was manipulative, and I was going to get no answers. For example, he stated that my mother abused him, you know, and that's why he became violent or what have you. So at that point, I was just wanting to disengage and leave, and I just needed to say goodbye and walk away. And so when I walked outside that prison and thought, you know, my daddy doesn't exist anymore. James Carson does not exist anymore. You know, that's Michael Bear Carson, and he is a pathetic creature, and he's like a rat in a cage. She's going to die in that prison, you know? And when I left, I felt at peace about leaving and walking away. In 2014, a law change in California meant older prisoners like Susan and Michael were permitted to apply for parole. I began a petition campaign and a media campaign against their parole. And I clearly stated that neither of these individuals has felt any remorse, neither have been rehabilitated, and both would kill again if released. You know, Karen Barnes' family, Clark Stevens' family, John Hellyer's family, these are incredibly good, kind people, and it was incredibly traumatic for them to have a, a parole hearing. It's scary to think of these two people back out on the street because they've never shown, to my knowledge, any remorse for their killings. Because in Susan's mind, they were killed for a reason. They were witches. Thankfully, parole was declined um, and denied. For Jennifer, she divided her dad in two, I think, as a coping strategy. The dad that she remembers when she was a young child who was loving, and the killer. I think what she's recognized as she's got older and integrated those experiences is that the dad that she remembers as a child actually never really existed. You know, um, James Carson, the man that brushed my hair and took me to the petting zoo, um, he was a mirage and he never existed. You know, there's only Michael Bear Carson, the monster that kills people and laughs about it. And I have nothing to say to Michael Bear Carson. <laughs>